the first question comes to us from our very own Melissa Starr. And it's something that she gets a lot. So she's asking, how should you prepare and approach a whiskey tasting that you're holding at your house? Um, so I did actually write a blog post about this and it's on my website, uh, bourbonrealtalk.com. Uh, first off, you're going to need glasses. And personally, when I do tastings, I like to use weed lens and not full size lens because it allows people to taste through a greater number of expressions without getting drunk. People have a tendency to pour in the glass based on the way that it looks and not based on how much alcohol is actually going in there. So the bigger your glass, the more each there, more of each pour they're going to drink. So I like to have weed glasses. I bought mine from ABV Network, but Sterling Cut Glass makes the other weed glasses for all the different distilleries. I know Iron Root sells them sometimes. So I like to have three glasses per person because I want them to be able to line things up side by side to taste the differences in things. I like to have a lint-free rag for each taster and a uh, room temperature bottled water. I think room temperature is important because if you give them cold and they rinse their glass, it's going to cause the glass to um, get condensation on it uh, because of the temperature difference. And it also will chill the next pour that they pour into the glass which can affect the flavor of the whiskey. And I usually like to teach them in the very beginning. The other thing is seating. You want everybody to have comfortable seating. A lot of times, you know, you got guys that are showing up that are, you know, 40 plus like myself. I can't stand for very long before my, my back starts to tighten up and, and feel painful. And so I like to make sure that I've got a backless chair for each person and they need a, you know, comfortable place to sit, sit where they can lay their glasses out in front of them and be able to easily access them and have enough space around them not to knock over the bottles and the glasses during the pours. When I start off, I explain to people how little we're actually pouring into each glass and I'll demonstrate and show like you only need about a 16th or an eighth of an ounce of each pour to taste it. And then I teach them that with an eighth of an ounce, that's enough to take, you know, three to five tiny sips so that you can taste that expression multiple times and really get a sense for it. And sometimes I'll even teach them how to smell the glass. I'll show them um, a lot of people will smell more off to one nostril versus the other. If you hold your mouth open a little bit, it gets away, gets rid of a little bit of that alcohol burn from the smell and allows you to pick up more of the flavor aromas. So you've lined out, you know, what the equipment needed, glasses, uh, lint-free rags, uh, you know, Glenn Cairns, recommendations on sizes is very, very, that's actually a very important stuff. And you make good points there. Um, uh, you know, comfortable chairs. Good. Uh, let's, let's talk, you know, let's quickly talk through, you know, how you want to go through what you're going to taste mm -hmm. for the evening. Maybe, um, I mean, spend a minute talking about how you might pair your whiskey. Do you want to approach it with, uh, you know, same distillery lineups? Mm -hmm. um, we did Mashable lineups. I mean, there's, there's options there. Maybe talk a little bit about that and then talk about how you're going to, you're going to go through the whiskeys, um, with the nose, the palate, the finish, and, and, and those kind of the, the things you might rate a whiskey on without going too deep into actually rating a whiskey. Sure. So I, I, each, I do flights and we'll do two to three pours per flight. Each flight is meant to teach you something. So I might do a Buffalo Trace mash bill one flight and have a, you know, several different expressions that are made for mash bill one, just to show the differences in age or proof. I might do a flight that's meant to show the difference between a weeded bourbon, a rye, um, a, a, a rye flavor grain bourbon and a, in a rye. And each, each flight is just meant to teach the person something either about age, about proof, about distillery, you know, that type of thing. And just so long as there's a purpose, it doesn't really matter. I mean, um, but I do like there to be some logic behind what the, the different uh, expressions are. And then between each flight, everybody pours a little water in the glass, eats the water, dries the glass, because even one water droplet can affect the flavor of the whiskey when you're pouring so little. And that's, um, that's also a good way to keep hydrated. And yeah, I mean, once each person has had a chance to
once I'm unmuted, yes. So once everybody's had a chance to take it, taste it, then it's just an open discussion. And really that's the fun part for me of doing tastings is the camaraderie and the discussion and there are no wrong answers, but everybody gets to share what their thoughts are. And I found the power of suggestion is extremely powerful with whiskey. And I've learned yeah. more from listening to what other people thought about a whiskey than really concentrating on it with my own senses. So to me, that's the value of, of doing that. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, that's very good. Very, very, actually really great point uh, to speak to really quick is, is throwing out, you know, it can be good and it can be bad, you know, throwing out, Hey, I taste banana in this or, or I taste mint or I taste, you know, rhubarb or whatever. Um, not everybody's going to be able to easily associate what they're tasting with, um, you know, a, a an item, a fruit, a, a, a leather, you know, tobacco, what have you. Um, and, and, and some people will, some people have the, you know, those synapses just disconnect and they say, Oh, that's, that's, uh, you know, appleberry jam or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, you can, you, you can throw out something like, Oh, I'm picking up a lot of dill and somebody that hasn't registered that it, it can, it can help them make that connection, but it also make them taste something that they don't necessarily taste. Um, so the, there's there's a lot of good and a lot of bad in sharing you know what you're picking up. Um, I don't I don't I don't personally lean one way or the other on it. Honestly, I just like to throw that out there. Um, but uh, the other thing I wanted to say real quick in, in a pause for Randall is any questions that you guys have about the current topic or questions you want us to ask. Um, you can drop them in the Zoom chat if you've got a question, you know, as we're talking through right now about leading a tasting. Uh, any questions there, drop them in the chat. If you want to message me directly and something be a little more anonymous, um, I won't put you on blast. Uh, shoot me uh, a private message on, on Facebook um, and uh, I, I'll, I'll get those uh, addressed as well. Um, and for anybody who's not familiar just by way of introductions that we did start off with that's randy uh i'm steve uh mcgee uh so uh, that's who you want to want to pm with, with questions here um but again if you have questions that you want to drop in the zoom um it, you know randy let's let's put some final thoughts maybe on on leading this tasting let's get into some of the other questions okay I don't have anything else to add to the tastings. So if you, if you All want right. a really detailed thing, <laughs> it's on my website. Good, good resources. Randy's got a lot of great resources on his website too. Uh, Randy, what's the, yeah, go ahead and plug the, the address for that website. It's bourbonrealtalk.com. <clears throat> awesome. Thanks. All right. So the, the next question here comes from Ronnie Everett and uh, he's asking if a distillery uses the same mash bill on multiple products and ages those products the same length of time, how does the placement of the, the barrels in the Rick house make a difference? How does it impact the, the flavor of the finish, you know, all of that? So that's a pretty interesting question because to my knowledge, the only distillery that consistently pulls um, different labels from different levels of the warehouse is wild turkey so wild turkey is rare they have their uh racks are 15 racks high which is pretty tall and they tend to get russell's reserve from the middle tier and um other products from the other tiers i don't know of any brand and steve you can speak to this if you know that very consistently picks the label that it's going into based on what level it was at at the warehouse. Um, I think that for most distilleries, it's based on the, the, the flavor profile for that brand. And they taste each barrel and they go, this one tastes more like a Buffalo Trace. This one tastes more like an Eagle Rare. This one tastes more like a uh, E.H. Taylor. And so that's how they decide what product lines they're gonna go to. Um, but the, the larger answer to that question is that in the where in the rick house the higher up it is the more heat it's exposed to 
and the less humidity it's exposed to. And so it's going to interact with that wood faster. It's going to get a more tannic flavor to it. Also, the closer it is to the outside of the warehouse is going to affect how much heat it's exposed to because the heat radiating off of those outside walls affects the outside barrels faster. Um, the brick, brick exterior or steel exterior is going to affect how quickly the temperature changes inside the rick house. And one of the things that's interesting is that the center and the bottom of the rick house, those barrels might go down in proof because there's uh, moisture being evaporated from the barrels that are up above and it's heavier than the atmospheric air. So it settles down and those barrels are thirsty. So they suck it up. And that can actually have a big impact on what that product can be made into because say that it's in the center of a 1792 warehouse and the proof actually goes down. Well, now it can't be a foolproof barrel because it's below 125, the bottling proof of that type. That happens a lot at, um, at, uh, uh, with uh, Russell's Reserve. If the Russell's Reserve gets below the 110, um, then they're gonna have to make it into a different product. Um, they also have to take in, in, into consideration the drop in proof when they filter it, which I didn't even know was the thing until uh, Eddie Russell told me. But that's the, the, the general answer to the question is I think that for the most part, they pick the barrels based on flavor profile and not based on location in the rickhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As Randall said, you know, higher in the, the rickhouse, uh, it affects the evaporation, which can, you know, drive up the, the proof um, for, for exiting the barrel um and ultimately impacts the flavor um and it's it is one of the things that uh, they 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 will taste those those products uh, those guys that are doing the same mash bill across their entire line um and, and putting different labels on it they're going to taste those products um and and then decide you know make sure that it fits that flavor profile um and there are even you know cases where um i've got a it, it's fairly rare, but I've got a Eagle Rare. It's a Eagle Rare store pick. Um, that was the, uh, keep me honest here, Randall, the, the normal mash bill is mash bill two. No, the normal's one. So I, okay. So the normal mash bill for, for Eagle Rare is mash bill one. Uh, I've got a store pick that was mash bill number two. Uh, and so it was aged 10 years like Eagle Rare normally is. And I guess when they taste it, it's like, Hey, this tastes like Eagle Rare. We're going to put the Eagle Rare you know, we're going to put this in our Eagle Rare barrels, um, but it was a mash bill number two. Uh, I, it, I have not dug in to understand any more rhyme or reason other than, uh, you know, my understanding of how they they taste the barrels and say, hey, this fits, you know, this flavor profile, put it in that, you know, that line of, of you know, things to be dumped. Um, so I have the, one more you know, really, really, Yeah. So um, whenever... I, I've had conversations with a handful of people that do blendings when it's for a really large release. So, you know, like the barrels that get blended for a, a small distillery release could be as, as few as two barrels, right? But for a big Kentucky distillery, it's like 500 barrels, sometimes more than that, sometimes 2,000 barrels. And I've been told that they do start to develop a history of, okay, well, we got a hundred barrels from these areas and these warehouses and another hundred from these areas and these warehouses. And they start with that as their base, taste it to see whether or not it's on profile and then make adjustments with um, barrels that have, you know, higher quantities of different flavor characteristics to adjust that blend to get it so that it's in alignment and there's consistency in the flavor of that whiskey. And so, I guess in that regard, they do technically start to identify brands with different locations in the warehouse, but it's not an exact science. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, all right. So the, the last one, actually, we're going to come back and make sure we got time for these that were submitted previously. There's a couple that have come in um, while, we're, while we're live here. And uh, let's go to the first one. And the question is, cast strength bourbon. How many, if any, drops of water are good to start with? This comes from popping the cork on True Blue Cast Strength um, that uh, uh, somebody won in the whiskey cake raffle. And I guess my understanding here is he felt it was a little, a little hot. 
So mm-hmm. how, how much water to, to start that proofing down process? Um, well, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I like to start with one drop. And I, and I know that sounds weird. Now, keep in mind, normally when I'm chasing a whiskey and I'm just trying to get a sense for it, I don't have but maybe a quarter ounce in my glass. And I did this really interesting experiment once where I went to Thanksgiving at my cousin's house and her mother-in-law was there and I had brought some um, Dag Juniors for everybody to try. And the mother-in-law said she wanted to try it, but she did not, she wasn't a drinker in general. She might have a glass of wine occasionally, but she certainly didn't drink whiskey and she darn sure didn't drink cash drink whiskey. And so I poured a little bit in the glass and I let her taste it and she made that shudder and all of that stuff. And I said, now watch this. And I got one drop of water and I dropped it in there and I swirled the glass around and I gave it to her and she's like, oh my God, that's totally different. And I don't fully understand the, chemistry behind this but i have seen um somebody who understood the chemistry write a blog post about how uh one drop of water causes some chemical reactions in your whiskey that take away a lot of the alcohol burn and i i I don't fully understand why so i would start with one drop and see where it's at but to be honest with you True blue cash drink to me is jet fuel. And I drink a lot of super <laughs> high proof whiskeys. And so it doesn't like I, I had five bottles of the EH or the Elijah Craig barrel proof hazmat, the 140.2. And I drank every one of them neat without adding any water or any ice. But I struggle to drink uh, true, true blue cash strength because it's just such a bold whiskey and it always tastes super hot to me. And so here's the thing. I mean, we're drinking not just to get drunk, right? I mean, we're trying to have an experience. And so take your time and just add a little bit at a time and see if you hit a sweet spot. And also keep in mind that when distilleries are tasting whiskeys to break them down and to figure out what their main flavor components are, they taste them at about 40 or 50 proof. And so you can't screw up and all of a sudden make it so you can't taste the flavors of the whiskey you're not going to add that much water to proof it all the way down to there. Now, when I interviewed Danny Khan, he said, it's not good to, it doesn't taste good to drink your whis- whiskey at that low proof. But what if you're trying, if what you're trying to do is figure out what a barrel's expression is, you'll find it if you proof it down that low. And so I- I'm not suggesting that you should proof it down that low, but I am letting you know, hey, just play with it and put a little bit of water in at a time until you get to a point that you're comfortable with the spirit and then drink it like that. And plus, it's fun. Yeah, so, and I think the, the key to, to being successful at that is invest in a little eyedropper mm-hmm. um, and only use it for water. And I would go so far as to order some Kentucky limestone water. Um, you can get it from Amazon. Um, I would run in and grab a bottle, but, uh, yeah, just use Kentucky limestone water. Um, it's not expensive. It's not hard to get. Um, it's the purest, uh, you know, and it's kind of what the whiskey's made with to begin with. So, um, it's gonna, it's gonna, and there's some artifacts about that, that water and the minerals in it that helps the, the kind of the chemical reaction, I guess, of the, the whiskey. So, um, I dropper uh lime uh kentucky limestone water and and uh room temperature you guys might talk about you guys might talk about some other waters if everybody doesn't have access to limestone and like what to stay away from and why um well i mean it depends on how much you're adding but i i use distilled water at the house um but the kentucky limestone water it's the it's the minerals that are in it that are supposed to be positively affecting the flavor but to be honest, I've not done a lot of experimenting with using different types of water. So if somebody has and you want to speak up, go ahead. But I will tell you that using ice water is not a good idea because the, the, the cold water being added to the whiskey, if, especially if it's a non-chill filtered whiskey, can cause the fatty acids that are in the whiskey to uh, congeal and make your whiskey cloudy. And um, sometimes it, I feel like it gives it a weird flavor. But does anybody know more about water types? 
Um, I, just oh, sorry, I didn't mean didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, just from what I know about uh, about ice and dilution from the bar, um, what we learned personally is uh, if you're not going to use like limestone water, if you don't want to go that far, you'll just want to get um, a water that's more filtered than tap water, essentially, because a lot of like the alkali metals and fluoride and stuff in tap water will kind of mess with it. Um, but the biggest thing we noticed is room temperature. And if you don't want to order limestone water, I mean, we did a lot of tasting and testing and we really couldn't tell the difference between different bottled water brands. Mm. Yep. Spring water is always good, but the, oops, sorry. The more natural you can find, the better. For sure. That's, that's what we learned as well. But we tried, I mean, we tried a bunch of different, uh, bottle it, you know, bottled waters. And the only thing that we learned is, uh, they, we had a regular tap water at the bar and then we had a, like a micron filter and the water out of the micron filter was a lot purer. I would say it just, it had a lot less going on. It seemed like it woke up the whiskey a lot more efficiently. Well, and, and I'll say that the, the using spring water or limestone water, which obviously has minerals in it, you're, you're doing two things. You're changing the ABV of the spirit, but you're also causing chemical reactions to take place in the spirit between the minerals and the, and the alcohol. So if your only intent is to change the ABV, then I would recommend that you use distilled water, um, which is effectively what they proof with at the distillery. And then I know, um, I, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I did want to add one little thing that I just remembered from talking to Danny when we were at 1792. Um, and he said essentially the science behind, the chemistry behind it is uh, the water molecule is heavier than, uh, than distilled whiskey is. So as, it, as you mix it and kind of pass it through, what it's doing, at least uh, to hear him explain it, is it's breaking down some of those chemical compounds that are present in the whiskey and kind of changing some of the lectins that you end up tasting. Mm. Yeah, I read a whole article about it, and I don't remember any of it. So. <laughs> I just remember him telling us about it and using a lot of words that went over my head. Hey, McGee, do you know who asked that cash strength question? Um, that was... That was me, um, Randy. I, Spencer yeah, Bragg. So I don't know. I don't know. If they, they mentioned me privately, so I didn't want to call them out. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. No. Oh, yeah, yeah. If, if I it, thought you said to, to send it privately. So No, no, no. You can ask it publicly. No, it's all good. I, just, I didn't want anyone to feel uncomfortable asking their question, um, you know, in case they were worried that it was going to be a dumb question or whatever. There are no dumb questions. But uh, anyway, what else you got for us, Steve? Uh, um. All right, so sorry, I uh, had to peel off for something. And my the next question we have here, um, do any common distilleries reuse barrels to age their, their bourbon product, or are they alleged in a new charred oak barrel? Uh, and who was the asker of that? Um, that's Ronnie. Ronnie. Brother, also. So he asked because most distilleries in Scotland like to use barrels from the U.S. to age their whiskey. Oh, so um, you and stay he wasn't line. sure if we have any that do that do that here. Um, hold on. In, in for for a bur so bourbon has to be in a new charred oak barrel to be considered bourbon. There's there's no requirement on age there. There 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 are other stipulations what depending on what how you're gonna label that bourbon, but it has to hit a, a new, unused, charred American oak barrel um, before it's bourbon. Now, I would say, in my opinion, there, I, don't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. There are probably some that are doing second char or something like that. I don't know. Like, think about like double oaked. It's going to hit a new charred oak barrel. And then is it hit a new charred oak barrel a second time? Or is it a reused, recharred barrel? the second time for that double oak process? So, uh, excellent question. So, uh, Steve hit the nail on the head. Has it be a new charred oak container, according to the code? No one's using anything but barrels. But, um, so, in, in Kentucky, the barrels that they get are not toasted. They're just charred. And the Kentucky, large Kentucky bourbon distilleries have long since established distribution channels for their used barrels because most of the world's spirits are aged in used 
Kentucky bourbon barrels because we produce so many uh, barrels that have only been filled one time. And there's still a lot of life left in that barrel, but the person who owned it originally can't use it, right? And so they go to Scotland uh, to age scotch. They go to the Caribbean to age rum. Um, Jack Daniels uh, sells tons of barrels to Tabasco and all Tabasco is aged in a used Jack Daniels barrel. And so I have seen a lot of craft distilleries that are releasing products that are not bourbons because you can age whiskey in a used barrel, but you can't age a bourbon in a used barrel. And so if I had to guess products like um, Michter's American Whiskey, is probably a reused barrel, right? Or at least in part, some of the some of the barrels that go into that are probably reused. Um, places like, um, um, well, all of the craft distilleries in Texas are reusing their barrels for other types of spirits, and that's an efficient way for them because if you're Iron Root in Denison, Texas, you don't have a lot of people from Scotland banging down your door trying to get your used barrels, right? So. Um, In some instances, the barrels are, they're able to sell them when they're used for a pretty significant percentage of what they paid for them new because those spirits need that flavor from the bourbon to achieve the flavor profile that they're looking for in that rum or that scotch and and they're willing to pay for it. And so that's kind of the way that the barrel game works. Now, the other question about products that are barreled twice in almost all instances, the second barreling is not necessarily a charred barrel, but a toasted barrel. Uh, the difference uh, being the, the amount of time and the intensity of the temperature of the flame that the barrel is exposed to. And when you take white oak and you expose it to a high temperature, but not enough to set it aflame immediately, and you hold it at that temperature for an extended period of time, it will break down, um, I think it's called selenosis or lignin layers inside the barrel, and it caramelizes the wood sugars deeper in the wood. And then when you put the, the, and the reason why they do it a second time is because they have to do it in a new charred oak barrel or it's not bourbon. And so they first make bourbon, then they put it in the second barrel that's toasted to pull out all of these, you know, marshmallow and brown sugar flavors and all of this stuff. And it's typically a sweeter whiskey. A lot of the craft distilleries though, are buying barrels that are actually manufactured for the wine industry that are both toasted and then charred. And so that's why sometimes like a really good example is the Belfort spirits. It's got this really weird, um, like, smoky sweet note to it those barrels are both toasted and charred um, but no bourbon only one use for each barrel and other finished whiskeys don't forget them what about what about the other finished whiskeys well bell mead does a lot of finished whiskeys like the honey the brandy blah 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 yeah, and in, in all those, does Cabernet and Merlot and Zinfandel. A lot, a lot of sure. finished whiskeys, and, and those are going to be used in your wine barrels. I think it's a little a good information, but a little bit outside of what Ronnie was was asking. Yeah, I think and, we got it covered. And to quickly address that, though, you make a bourbon, and then you can put it in anything that you want. But if you put it in a barrel that used to have something else in it after it's legally bourbon, it goes into a specialty class. Um, that when you file for your COLA approval, it's called a 641 specialty spirit. And you're allowed to say that it's bourbon finished in, but from a legal perspective, it's technically no longer bourbon. It says bourbon on the label because it was bourbon at one time, but it's technically no longer bourbon. And there you have it. Yeah. So on, on the, the bourbon topic, <laughs> um, Quickly go through uh, what is a, you know, single barrel, mm-hmm. bottled in bond. Well, let, I'll just do this. So describe a single barrel bourbon. Um, there's no legal definition for a single barrel bourbon, but the general 
rule in the industry is that you dump a barrel and you do you filter if you're going to filter you proof if you're going to proof and you fill bottles until there's no more whiskey left and then you dump another barrel and do that separate and on your on your packaging on your labeling it has it'll say that it's a single barrel bourbon and it will usually you know give you a barrel number and a dump date and all that stuff um, most bourbons are batched um, in, in, in the batching process, they'll dump between two and say 2000, depending on the size of the distillery, uh, bourbons into a vat, let those barrels marry together and then they filter proof and bottle. And so that's the difference between a single barrel and a regular and a small batch, small batch or whatever. No, yeah. And a regular or a small batch. And, and the thing to note, small batch there there are no there's no legal definition for what is considered a small batch either they can stick the small batch if they blend if they they married two barrels or if they married as, as randall said 2000 um they can still stick that small batch uh label on there um and it sounds like they could stick a single barrel on there if they wanted but i'm pretty sure they would get you know ostracized if they did something that egregious um so, so that was single barrel. Uh, let's go bottle and bond. Bottle and bond. Act. A little bit of one hundred and one here, real quick. We should have started with this question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so bottle and bond act was fought for by the illustrious Colonel E. H. Taylor. He got the act passed in eighteen ninety six or seven. I can't remember which year. And basically, it's a it it was. It was the first consumer protection law in the U.S. code. And back then, whiskey was, was everything. It was all of our taxes. It was our currency. People traded for goods for it and everything. But there was a problem that it was getting adulterated before it would make it into the hands of the consumer. And there were people that were getting sick because they would go to their local, what we consider pharmacy. The pharmacy had a barrel. And they'd, put, they'd fill your jug up with their whiskey, but they had done stuff to it, right? They had put tobacco spit from a spittoon in it to make it dark. They had put uh, sulfuric acid in it to make it burn when you drank it. They'd put all kinds of stuff in it to, in, to, to refill the barrel after they had sold a bunch of it so they could make more money and people were getting sick. So Colonel E.H. Taylor People were getting sick, going blind. There was well, all kinds of health problems. I mean, that's... It's one of the things that like, people should care what goes into their whiskey. I mean, that was, it's a, it's a law, Consumer Protection Act, because it needed to be. Right. And so basic, the basic tenets of the law were that, and, and it doesn't exactly, now the, the distilleries just swear they followed all the rules. But when it first started, the distillery had to hire a government employee who would come to the distillery in the morning with the key, and he would unlock the distillery let all the workers in and he had to be the last one that left and he would just walk around the facility all day long and he would check on the uh, barrels and he would take samples out of anything he wanted to make sure that they weren't adulterated and these people were famously wild alcoholics uh that's why you wanted this job it's a dream you, job you just got to walk around a distillery and drink out of barrels all day long right and that is the epitome of government work meets heaven right <laughs> and and so a bottle and bond whiskey it has to be made um from all barrels that were made in a single season every year is broken into uh two six month long seasons it has to be from one distillery um it has to be um aged at least two years um but if it's Age between two and four years, it has to have an age statement. So almost all bottled and bond products um, don't have an age statement. And all you know is that they're more than four years old. And it has to be bottled at 100 proof. Because that was one of the things that people were doing to trick consumers was they were proofing the whiskey down. And then they were getting less than what they paid for. And so 100 proof became the standard. Um, and I think that's enough for that. But yeah, I mean, you can look it up. There's well, all yeah. Of so there, we did have one question that came in, um, and it was, and he asked, the so Joe asks, so federally bonded doesn't really functionally mean anything now. Uh, I mean, 
in my opinion, and Randall can can add to this or correct it. It it still means something. I mean, it it means that they they say they're abiding by the rules, and you're not getting Heaven Hill product in a you know Jim Beam bottle, you know stuff like that. I mean, it, it's to the whole cross pollination. You could have anything in there as well as, you know, the uh, adulteration of, of what's, what's, you know, meant to be in there. Um, you know, I don't know if, if the whole federal bonding process is still uh, that, that closely watched or monitored. I know you don't have to have the government worker on staff all the time. I think we kind of, there may be what some pop-up testing or something. I don't know. Yeah. You, you I mean, know anything about that? That's, that's basically the risk, right? So, when you get your, um, your, your DSP, um, your distiller special permit, I think is what it's called, and you're allowed to produce spirits, there is a on-site inspection uh, by government officials. And there, you have already laid out your entire warehouse. You're telling them where all your products are going to be. And there are sections of your warehouse that are bonded sections, and there are sections of your facility that are non-bonded. And the reason why I learned that is because we found out that we can do bottle shares at distilleries just so long as no one goes into the bonded section of the warehouse, right? Um, and there are uh, audits that happen where government employees will come out and they'll audit your facility. And if they come out there and they find evidence that you violated the rules on something that you submitted a COLA approval for as bottled and bond, then you lose your, your DSP. And it costs it nowadays a minimum of $5 million to get started and you lose all $5 million. You're done. Your life's over. And so I don't think that there's a lot of producers out there willing to ri risk their whole lives to violate the bottled and bond act, knowing that a government official can walk in at any moment and they have full access to the facility. And if they get caught, their life's over. So, um, you know, I, I trust it. Yeah, it, it should still mean something. Um, kind of like a handshake. So uh, the the next part of this, this you know, barrel proof, cast strength, full proof. I mean, there 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 are a lot of terms that you might just equate to. Uh, this is what it came out of the barrel at, and that's what I'm drinking it at. But those terms are actually very different. Um, do you want to go through those? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is one of my favorite subjects. So the two easiest to deal with are cash strength and barrel proof. Basically, those terms mean the same thing. Now, there are terms that get used on labels like small batch that might just be marketing puffery. And then there's terms that get used on labels like single barrel that um, there may not be a technical legal definition for, but there there is an obligation from the person that's sub submitting for the label approval that they're not allowed to deceive the consumer. Okay. And so they can't purposely lie. So they can't do a 2000 barrel blend and call it a single barrel and not get in trouble. If they get caught, they're in trouble and their DSP could be in jeopardy. So when it comes to cash strength and barrel proof, those terms basically mean the same thing. One term got popular overseas in Scotland and Ireland, and that's cash strength. Um, and then one term got popular in the United States, and that's barrel proof. And they, what they mean is that they dump the barrel and they put it in the bottle at whatever proof it came out of. Doesn't have anything to do with it being a single barrel. There might be 2,000 barrels that went into a barrel proof whiskey. Um, and some of those barrels might have been 145 proof and some of them might have been 110. But if the average comes out 130.2, then it's 130.2. Um, and some of the times they filter those whiskeys and filtration actually drops your ABV a little bit. And so it's just whatever the finished proof is, that's what it is. And so you'll notice on virtually all barrel proof and cash strength whiskeys, the ABV has a point something to it. So it's not like 125, it's like 125.6, right? Now, foolproof is a little bit harder to understand, and that is that 
when whiskey is comes off of the steel uh, for the second time, if it's a column still, they usually distill it twice, high wines and low wines. And when it comes off the second time, it's usually around 140 proof at most distilleries. Some are higher, not many. Some are lower because they believe it's leaving a little bit more flavor in there. But regardless of what it is, it's usually above 125 proof, which is the maximum legal proof that that spirit can go into that new charred oak barrel and it be considered a whiskey because you can't, you know, put it in the barrel at, you know, 140 and call it bourbon. And so they got to prove it down before they, they put it in. They got to prove it down before, before they barrel it. Before they barrel prove it. it down again after. Right. And so normally what happens is they proof it down and almost all distilleries are 125. Uh, NGPI is at 120. Um, I think um, um, Russell's is at one. I want to say 110. And so they, they prove it down. They put it in the barrel. And whatever happens, happens. And we talked about that a little bit, right? That sometimes the proof goes up. Sometimes the proof goes down, depending on humidity and heat, age, time, all that stuff. And if it's a foolproof whiskey, what they're saying is, is that, yeah, we age this product. We put it in the barrel at 125. It made its way back up to 133. And we did proof it down, but we stopped when we got back to the original barrel entry proof. And so full proof means that the distillery proofed the whiskey back down to its original barrel entry proof. And so it's, it's gonna be an exact number. It's gonna be 125. It's gonna be 114 in the case of Weller full proof. It's gonna be 125 in the case of, um, um, 1792. Yeah. And so that's, that's what those three terms mean. Right on. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and kind of on that, uh, Joe asked another question that I, 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 he asked, why do they cap it at 125 to call it whiskey? Um, I don't know, science. <laughs> what do you know about that, Randall? Um, so if you think about, a aging process the whiskey is chemically reacting with compounds that are inside the wood of the barrel that it's aging in and water pulls out different flavor compounds than alcohol does and so over the years when they would come together to create what the definition of a spirit category was they would start to survey the producers and find out what they did. And what everyone found was that there wasn't really anybody making whiskey that was going in the barrel above 125. And so that became the definition of the flavor characteristic of whiskey is that it needs to not go in the barrel above 125. Because if you put it in there at 160, that higher alcohol content is going to pull different flavor compounds out of that barrel. And even if you proof it back down to 90, it's not going to taste like whiskey it's going to taste like something else and so it just that just became the definition of what whiskey tastes like all right so um i kind of go back to my answer science i'm sure there was a lot of trial and error and they figured out hey this is what ends up with good bourbon this ends up with some like undrinkable shit I'm, right you know. <laughs> um so, and I totally glossed over Kobe's question. He asked this a long time ago, so I'm going to throw this one in here. Um, if, you, <laughs> if you could wave a magic wand and change one law um, without any opposition in the whiskey world and possibly put a new law on the books, what law would you change or enact? Oh, this is easy for me. I don't have an answer for that, so I'll let you answer first, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll draft off of that. Uh, producers would be able to um, direct ship to consumers. Ding 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 ding, you win. And and the reason no, I like that. The reason why is if you go down to Fredericksburg, Texas, which is now the second largest wine region in the United States, it was ten years ago. What? Uh, someone got Oh, on. sorry. I didn't realize I was on mute. Yeah. It was 10 years ago. I lived down there. And um, 
I used to go over there and there were like six or seven wineries. When Texas changed the law that wineries were allowed to direct ship to consumers, it changed everything. Um, and now if you go down there, there's probably 30 or 40 different wineries down there because it became safe for investors to put their money into that type of business venture because now they had a way to get their, their product out to consumers. With our three-tier system that we have, the producer could literally make the best whiskey in the world. I mean, like better than anything you've ever tasted. And it wouldn't make a difference on whether or not that brand was successful because they're 100% dependent upon the wholesaler and the retailers, the many retailers that the wholesaler convinces to buy that product to give them good product placement and to educate their staff about that product and to convince people to try it and buy it because they're not allowed to market their own product to consumers. And if you could change that one thing, if producers could direct ship their products directly to consumers, then we would no longer be looking to the wholesalers to pick the winners and losers in the craft production space. It would be up to consumers to vote with their dollars the way we do it in America because we believe in entrepreneurship. This is the only industry that that I am aware of that cannot ship their products to consumers. You can buy guns and have them shipped. It does have to go through somebody who's licensed, but you can buy a gun online and have it shipped to you, but you cannot buy alcohol online and have it shipped to you. And I think that's nonsense. Hey, Randy. Yeah. Kentucky just passed a law that the, they can ship now. I think that it's uh, retailers that can ship and it's only inside the state. But um, right now, I don't think producers can ship. They just, they just changed it from the post-COVID that producers can ship it only to reciprocity states, so we're not included. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so yeah, it, it's like where it's going, that's governed by the state that's going to receive it. And this is kind of like California legalizing marijuana. It's still federally illegal right. to ship alcohol. That law is going to change, though, a lot of states. I mean, Texas, with as much as we have going on, that's going to change quickly. I, I, I have heard many experts talk about this subject, and I've heard multiple of them say it will not happen within our lifetime because the wholesaler lobby, RNDC, and Southern Glaciers is too powerful, and they have too many politicians in their pocket, and they won't let it change because they like having that monopoly. But you never know what's going to happen in a pandemic. Right. I, I hope it changes. I do. I do. Yeah. I mean, it really is. I, I know we've got some people that work for Republican Glaciers that, that uh, are with us in the whiskey community, but ah, they're such a pain in the ass for hunting whiskey. Well, for accessing I, whiskey, not just hunting. They're, they're a pain in the ass for getting to it. And, and let me say this for anybody who works for a wholesaler there will always be a place for wholesalers because they, they distribute product. Wild Turkey isn't going to buy a fleet of trucks in every state in the United States and every country in the world. There's already a business that did that and they charge a reasonable rate to distribute those products for Wild Turkey. What would make the, and Wild Turkey's not going to spend the time to direct ship one bottle of whiskey to every consumer. You know what I'm saying? It's just, they're just not going to do that. But what it would help with is the smaller producers that are coming online and they're trying to prove their salt with the quality of their product. And if they, you know, take Lone Elm, for example, I love Lone Elm's whiskey. They don't have the biggest, be most beautiful operation out there, but you go out there and you have a good time and you love their whiskey and then you go back to your home state, guess what? You will never get to buy it again. You will never get to buy it again. And that doesn't make any sense. We need to create tourism around this. It creates jobs. And, we, and if there is tourism, they need to allow those distilleries to be able to stay in contact with those consumers they collected by creating a tourist opportunity, in my opinion. I love that question, by the way. Yeah. And yeah, uh, I, I second that. I don't have a, I don't have a law that I, I dislike more. Um, so <laughs> the Ross, Jesus Christ. Um, you had a legit question before I saw that one. I thought, um, 
Yeah, I started on the whiskey before Randy did, I'm sure. I've been smoking salmon for a few hours, so um, I started drinking when I put salmon in the smoker. Fuck it, I'm going to read it. What are your thoughts on how the Chinese market has impacted the U.S. market and significantly inflated the price of bourbon? This has driven distillers to greatly increase the cost and the trickle-down effect has totally changed the market in the last years alone. Will this ever correct? That's an interesting question. Um, so, and uh, first off, let me say I understand the difference between China and Japan. But the, the huge market demand for American whiskey started in Japan, and quite honestly, it saved the bourbon industry. If it wasn't for Japanese consumers buying whiskey while all the Americans turned their backs on it to drink clear spirits like vodka and gin, a lot of the producers that we know and love today would have gone out of business in the 80s and 90s. Um, so there's, there's, always, um, there's always something good to be said for demand. Um, in the 90s and early 2000s, as the um, communist nation of China started to re uh, release some of the controls and started to allow some entrepreneurship, they entered heavily. All of these new rich people that were nouveau rich, they'd never had money before, and all of a sudden they have tons of it, they entered heavily into the alcohol space. And they screwed up the wine market, They've obviously had an, they've screwed up the scotch market and they have had an impact on the bourbon market. But all of that stuff is always temporary. And what we need to understand is that almost every distillery in the state of Kentucky right now is going through some sort of an expansion to increase production. And ultimately, we all win when that happens. So we may have to deal with the short term of them creating market demand and us shipping product over there that we wish we could have kept here in the United States. However, um, thanks Trump, the reason why we're getting Blanton's gold in the United States is because of the tariffs. And so where China and Europe and Japan were huge consumers of the Blanton's gold product and there, was not a, there wasn't enough whiskey for Sazerac and Buffalo Trace to release um, Blanton's gold in the United States because of the tariffs and there's fewer, there's less product that's being shipped overseas right now. It made smart business sense for them to launch that product here in the United States where they were not as affected by the tariffs. In my opinion, I, 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 I got, so I need to, I need to double click on that, um, right there because, um, I would need to, 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 to pull it up. But, my understanding was that there was an agreement with Buffalo Trace before, like going way back before Sazerac bought them or something like that, that gold and straight from the barrel, special reserve, and those, those specialty lines of Blanton's would only be sold overseas, not because there wasn't enough demand for it here. And, and which is what I read and what you just said, why we don't get gold here. It, it was not there was not enough demand for it to be sold here uh, because it, 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 there was some kind of agreement that uh, that restricted us from restricted Buffalo Trace and Sazerac from selling those uh, those brands those late I guess those those editions uh, domestically. I I, I can I can quickly Google that, but I used to tell I'm that pretty story. Pretty positive. I read that. I used to tell that story that, uh, that Blanton's was a, a premium product that was highly sought after in Japan, that Curin, um, the beverage company, bought the rights to Buffalo Trace or to, uh, to that uh, Blanton's brand and that they licensed back the right uh, to do the, the Blanton single barrel in the United States and that everything else was restricted. I used to tell that story. However, I was listening to a podcast with Harlan Wheatley and the interviewer asked Harlan Wheatley whether or not they were restricted from selling Blanton straight from the barrel and Blanton's gold in the United States. And he said they were not. And this was probably a year and a half ago. And he said, you know, we, we just don't have enough product to do it. 
And so when all of a sudden this, this, you know, news hits the streets that they're going to release this product that we all previously thought was prohibited through licensing agreements. Um, and the only thing that's really changed is the tariffs have come into effect. I, I mean, I believe that the tariffs made it. So it, 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 so it is. So I, would, I just, I found an article really quick. Um, it is driven by the tariffs, but it was, it was the parent company. It was Takara who bought the rights to, uh, um, they bought the rights to Buffalo Trace, Eagle Rare, and Stag and Blanton. Um, and it, it, they, they were the ones that made that decision that those are only uh, overseas bottles. And now it is with the tariff, they're not, they're, they're, the prices, I guess, demand is dwindling over there. So now they're thinking about, I guess, are going to release at least gold here. but. Um, there's no mention of any straight from the barrel, special reserve, red or black coming to come into the U S. Gotcha. Okay. Well, so we're both, so it wasn't right. a law or anything. It was just a holding parent company, holding company, whoever owns the right to the brand were dictating what went where. And I now think, they're feeling the pinch of Trump. I think it's Curin, but I know it's a Japanese beverage company. So yeah, I'm just. This is uh, ChicagoBourbon.org who mentioned Takara uh, was okay. the article that I right. found. It made um, me go in the but, book. Uh, so um, Mark uh, Meyer asks, "What is one thing that you wish you knew earlier in your whiskey journey?" Um. I know what it is. Um, so, of course, the obvious answer is how rare things were going to get. Um, because when I started in 2004, the only thing you couldn't get was uh, Pappy Van Winkle's and uh, Buffalo Trace Antique Collection. And those weren't impossible to find, right? Like they are now. Um, but yeah, I wish I would have bought more when it was all available. That having been said, that's not the one thing that I wish I would have known. The one thing that I wish I would have known was whiskey is the same as cash. Because when I met Dwayne Poor, who has a $7 million whiskey collection, he didn't get his $7 million whiskey collection because he paid $7 million for it. He got it because he saw that the value of bottles of whiskey were going up. And so when he wanted one, he didn't buy one. He bought 10. And then he drank the one he wanted and then he bunkered the rest. And now he has such a huge value of whiskey that he can drink world-class whiskey for the rest of his life and he'll never dig into his principal, right? And that's, yeah. that's what I wish I would have known that I wouldn't have been so hesitant because there was a long time that I would never buy more than one bottle of whiskey because I opened everything that I bought and I wanted diversity. And I wish I would have known, hey, feel free. If there's five, buy five and then sit on them. And if you ever want cash, you can convert any bottle of whiskey into cash inside of 30 minutes. You know, that's, that's not the issue. Um, and, and I wish that I would have looked at the future of whiskey as more of an investment and I'd have a much larger whiskey portfolio than I do right now. Yeah, I, I, I probably second that. I mean, I um, I hit the game when I got in the game. I got in late. It wasn't probably till I don't know 2015 that I really got into bourbon seriously. I mean, I drank a shit ton of Jack and Coke and everything growing up uh, through college and and you know young professional, but. Um, it was like 2015 that I really started uh, getting into Maker's Mark and Basil Hayden's and Four Roses. Um, and I actually had a friend tell me back then that Maker's Mark, um, right before they did the whole, uh, thought they were going to change the proof and proof it down a little bit, which caused a scare. But just in general, what, what led to that was like, hey, you know, they can't right now, their de bourbon demand is picking up. And this was probably actually more like 2014 that he told me that and which probably led to me getting more serious about trying bourbons, but I didn't 
didn't realize the the the, the scale of what was going to happen like like randy said um and uh you know I, I didn't start buying multiple bottles of the stuff that i was buying to drink at that time and uh I, that that would have been something that that i would have done differently um you know let's i, I would like to say let's Let's get um, on that same question. Um, you know, it, let's get somebody from the crowd to 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 chime in with what they wish they would have learned earlier on in their journey. Um, I'm just looking at the screen here. Uh, I don't want to call anybody out, but who's this? Um, Colin, um, you're you're front and center on my screen, and uh, I noticed you have a very nice collection behind you. So. What would you have liked to have learned earlier in your journey? Uh, <laughs> put me on the spot, man. So, put you on the spot. Yeah, what, what would I like to have learned earlier? And, and keep in mind, so let's see, so I just turned 36. I think when I was in the military, 18, 19, 20 years old, I was drinking Irish whiskey. That was, that was my jam, 100%. I think because my brother-in-laws, my dad always drank Irish, uh, so tell them or do you know, Jameson, like whatever. Um, and that's what I knew. I wasn't actually really, I've never really been a big beer drinker. And that there was a natural progression there. After I got out of the military, I think I was buying a suit, like a really nice place. And they had scotch and they had a, a Balvenie 12 year double wood. And so I tried that and I was like, this, this is good. And so that kind of opened my world into scotch. I've only recently gotten into bourbon over the past few months, maybe. Um, yeah. so, so my, my experience with bourbon is very fresh. So I feel like I can hopefully contribute something here. I think, uh, what's really, really important for, for people to know, you know, is that everyone's taste is, is significantly different. And, um, one thing I would have, I went out and I just started buying stuff. I just started buying, yeah, that looks, that's a cool looking bottle. I'll buy it. Turns out it's, you know, you know, what do they call it? Tennessee garbage water, uh, or whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I encourage people to get involved uh, with the group, especially when it comes to samples. Um, you know, may, maybe find a bottle or just ask people. There's a lot of people that will be willing to just kind of give stuff away. But, like, seek out samples, two ounces, four ounces, whatever you can get to help, you know, just experiment to kind of find out what your specific taste profile is and where that lies. Because, man, it is wildly different. Um, I just bought two bottles of Blanton's from a guy who doesn't like Blanton's. He got into it. He bought three or four right up front because he was like, this is it. Everybody loves it. It's got to be amazing. He cracked open one bottle and was like, "Yeah," you know, and it turns out he's a high proofer, man. He really just likes, um, you know, Stag. Stag Jr., that's like his jam. 11, 12, 13, he's got a bunch of those. So um, everyone's different. And, you know, I guess hand in hand with that is don't hate on people that, that don't like stuff that's different, you know, like uh, – is you know i think it's the your favorite i've said it before right but the favorite drink or the best drink in the world is the one that you like and it's it's in your currently in your glass so um yeah anyway i don't know if that's helpful at all but you know um, it is ask, it is i couldn't you know, i couldn't have asked for a better set of advice especially as we're kind of going through some of this one on one stuff is people can't tell you what you're gonna like i mean and and, and I've, I've tried to preach that from day one get samples uh, that, that's, that's great advice that you, you gave is, is, you know, what I like, you may not like, there's, there's a lot of commonality, obviously, uh, and it kind of comes in swaths, but, um, yeah, not everybody's going to like a finished, a Cabernet finished bourbon. And some people are going to just absolutely love it. That's going to be their jam. Great answer, man. Great answer. Yeah. And, and um, for what, anybody, for anybody who's listening, that's new in the club, this may be news to you, but for those of us that have large whiskey collections, we don't drink it. We have our 10 or 15 bottles that we drink all the time, but I'm not pulling down my Pappy 15 and taking pours of it on a Tuesday night. I'm waiting for you to win one of my randos so that you can come over and I can give it to you, right? And most pe you'll find that most people are like that in the whiskey industry or in the whiskey collection era because people, they want to they wanna share, they want to drink with you. And so don't have any hesitation to jump out there and say, hey, I, I don't have much, but what I have, I'm willing to share. Who wants to you know, swap samples or whatever? And what I found is not only does that give you opportunities to try things that you weren't going to try, but I call it pressing the flesh 
right? And when this is all over, we may not shake hands anymore, which would break my heart because I love shaking hands. But like getting together and being face to face, man, you might find the next, your next job that's going to like rocket your career. You might find an amazing client. You might find a new best friend. You don't know, but you're not going to find that person if you don't put yourself out there. And I just want to encourage everybody to do that. Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, so I, do, I got a question here from Jason. He's asking, can you buy whiskey in a neighboring state and bring it back to Texas? Yes. Up to six liters. Absolutely. All day. Yeah. There, there are limitations on what you can, can legally carry there, you know, on the plane, there's a five liter, I think limitation on, on for, from TSA. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's, there's no problem with transporting that across state lines. It's just kind of buying and shipping across state lines. Uh, Texas does not allow legally uh, you to, to ship uh, what it's, it's just distilled spirits. I think beer and wine are, I know wine is okay. I think beer is okay. I think it's just distilled spirits. You can't ship into Texas legally though. So, I don't know how many bottles I've had shipped across the state lines. Yeah, if it's above 18%, 18%. yeah, you can't. You also, you also might want to talk about hazmat on a plane. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, so any spirit that's above 140 proof is considered, oh, yeah. um, it's considered a hazard in uh, the belly of a plane for shipping because it can spontaneously combust and turn the plane into a fireball and kill all the people on board. <laughs> so uh, never. Bad day. Bad day. Never, sh never ship a bottle of whiskey that's above 140 proof unless it's ground. Okay. Ground only above 140 can be taken on a plane. Um, while we're talking <laughs> about, uh, whiz or alcohol, uh, crossing over borders, um, you can take samples on a plane. Okay. So you can take mini bottles and I have taken samples before. I just seal them up with a little bit of, um, paraffin wax. So they know that the bottle's not been opened. And I was told you can have up to six, but I've taken more than that and not have any complaints. I just put it in a clear Ziploc bag, throw it on the conveyor belt um, in my little basket when I'm getting on the airplane and no one's ever said anything to me about it. Yeah, I've, I've, I've carried samples on the plane. Uh, I always, when I go to a vacation in Jamaica or it, it, hell, anywhere overseas that is not Europe, I'm, I'm always taking bourbon with me because I can't trust I'm going to find what I want when I get to the resort. Um, so this is a really good question here. Um, this, is, this comes from Brian. Uh, why is it called a Rick house? Who is Rick? No, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. That's terrible. That's just, I, had to, I had to throw that out there. Brian's busting balls over here. You, uh, you stumped the chump. I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, so Spencer's got another good question. How many of us will ever see Blanton's gold here? Um, and and I'm, I guess I'm going to kind of add that. I'm pretty sure he means find it at a retail location um, because it's all over the place on the secondary market. But uh, I've got my thoughts. Randall, what are your thoughts on how many of us will see Bland's gold here? I think the same number of us that have found Weller foolproof at, uh, retail. I think it'll, I think it's going to be less than that. Do you? I, I, I do. Um, but again, I haven't seen foolproof at retail either. Um, so, um, you know, I bet we see it. Damn, I, don't, I just don't know. I, maybe we see it in some bars. Maybe we see a handful on prim. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, on on the in retail locations, but I just don't. I mean, hell, it's hard enough to find normal Blantons um, in the store today. So gold is. It's just going to be. It's going to be harder to find. I imagine. And what did they say the retail price was going to be, like 125 or something like that? Yeah. You think they've been watching the secondary market? <laughs> I know they are. Hey, Patty, we're getting a little background noise. Can you mute your thing? Hey, Randy, you also right. have the ability to mute, to mute anybody you need as well. I don't because I gave up my host rights to uh, Baptista. 
I tried. Only for suckers. Lay down the law, Baptista. I got you. Um, all right, you're so, slacking. <laughs> by, by the way, uh, the the fact checkers have been working diligently in the background around the Rick House question, and it's been found that <laughs> Rick House is named after the original oak that was used in whiskey barrels. Ah, okay. I like and talking thing. about like, Rick House, it makes me bring up something else because I have a Rick House that I'm giving away. I just have to say because Spencer sent me something while I was on the uh, chat. I didn't want you to think I was ignoring it. I just can't respond giving right away now. A Rick House. Oh, I really didn't want to, but Spencer Price, congratulations, brother. He bought the last cab at, um, for the Redwood Empire at Loyalty. He just sent me the receipt, and I'm giving away a Russell's Reserve. I was kind of praying to God that you guys didn't do sell it out <laughs> because I wanted to keep it. But, yeah, congratulations, Spencer. I saw your message. I just well, wanted to so he won a bottle. Don't, he didn't win a Rick House. Don't, well, don't. It's a, it is a Rick House. A Rick, it, it comes from a Rick yeah. House, and I think it's actually <laughs> H. Don't give him anything. His, week's, his week's been good enough winning bottles, so he doesn't. Well, need he didn't win anything. He, but he's going to be in the in the raffle to win. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to disrespect or interrupt. I was about to say if it, if I won that too, I need to go get a lottery ticket while I'm at it because I've been I've had a lucky week. Well, if you do win it, just go ahead and bring me a bottle in return that you did win, and we call it even. All right, sounds good. All right, let's see. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ross. <laughs> Ross. Why is Cullen's 1792 collection all missing one pour? <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll, no, there's an actually, there's an answer for this. And, and it's actually more than that. It's probably, if we're talking analysis, it's probably five pours because I sample one pour. And then I have a, like a little library of, uh, I pour off four ounce samples of, of every, every bottle that, every unique bottle I get. So not every single bottle, but Here's a Knob Creek Rye small batch. Um, I've probably got a Weller Antique right here. Um, so I probably have like these boxes that I get hold 12 four ounce, uh, 12 four ounce bottles. So I have six of six of these. And five of Dude, them. That's are awesome. So and and like I, I need to get some waxes. I want to wax seal them, make nice labels for them, and then I want to have like a nice rack where maybe with, like a door where you know it's like a library of, of like everything I've ever had. Um, you know, you never know. It might be a zombie apocalypse where I can break them out and use them for, for um, you know, for trading, for bartering. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, Not that I like question, that. Randy. I've thought about that. Yeah. I like that. So um, I think just in case anybody didn't watch your video that I think was freaking amazing, um, if you want, just in case somebody doesn't have a clear understanding, can you kind of go over uh, <laughs> the barrel program and then also – what it takes to get great barrel picks? I'll try to do a super abridged version. Um, so basically, they're, not all whiskey labels are available for barrel picks. And if you've sought out barrel picks, you get to know which labels are available. And not all labels are available to all stores. So it's not like we can just walk into loyalty and go, hey, we want to do a Weller foolproof. From a allocation standpoint, it's the wholesaler who decides who's going to get that barrel um, if it's an allocated barrel from Kentucky. And you have to earn the right to get that barrel from that wholesaler. And typically you do it by buying their other higher margin products and selling them in your store, which is why you buying your wine from our you know, barrel partner store, you buying your vodka from the barrel partner store, will actually help us get better barrels. Um, and, and then we also have to support barrels that are easier to get because the, the wholesaler doesn't want to give away a barrel that they know can sell at any retail location um, to a whiskey club unless we've done something for them. So they would like us to do some barrel picks of maybe some Texas whiskeys that aren't on allocation or maybe a lesser known, you know, producer from outside of Kentucky or a smaller producer in Kentucky. And we kind of work our way up the food chain and earn our right in, into those higher level barrels. And since barrels can be awarded at the, the producer level, like what we have done with balconies with the, um, with the, the two barrels of, um, it's slipping my mind right now. But anyway, the, the, the two barrels of the American spirit that we did 
Um, barrels can be awarded at the wholesale level, which wholesalers are not really awarding the kind of barrels that we want right now because they don't need us like they used to before whiskey got super popular. And then barrels can be awarded at a retail level. And each retailer has to work its way up the food chain. And so we as a club might be working our way up the food chain with multiple retailers at once, which means that we're, you know, encouraging you to go buy their crappy vodka and whatnot. And we are doing, you know, barrel picks of say larceny, you know, larceny is not an allocated bourbon. It's not really difficult to get a hold of. I mean, I think we still sold it out in an hour, but I think that has to do with the fact it's a solid, you know, heaven hill product and it's, you know, it was 20 bucks. Um, but we have to do those with each one of the stores to work them up in the food chain so that they are able to get those higher level uh, barrels. And for us, we have to take into consideration whether or not we can market and sell that barrel. And that's something that a lot of people don't think about because if we stick a store with a barrel, it can injure them financially and it can injure their relationship with um, their wholesaler. Um, which affects them across multiple brands and it can injure their relationship with that producer. It can affect their allocation of other bottles that they were hoping to get for that uh, particular producer. And so if, if we get a, you know, Blanton's pick, then the wholesaler may decide not to give them the regular Blanton's allocation and they have to take into consideration whether or not not having those products is going to impact the loyalty of their regular customers that aren't members in the club. And so when we are doing a pick and we're shipping some of the bottles to Atlanta and Chicago and Colorado, those are people that don't regularly buy product from their store. And we have to, you know, take into consideration, can we sell the bottle out? They have to take into consideration that if they give us this bottle, is it going to affect their regular retail sales? And it's all a balancing act. And so that's kind of the 10,000 foot view. And the other thing is, is that we have to negotiate with each retailer what their markup is going to be on the barrel. And that can be a problem when we're releasing product through multiple retailers, because one retailer may have a standard 30% markup. And then like, you know, a, a big box store like Goody Goody pays less money for the product than a smaller independent store does. And they're able to sell it for less money and make the same profit. And they have much higher volume, so they operate off of lower margins anyway. And so it's always this big fight to get everybody to sell it for the same price and a good, get a good price and negotiate a good price for our uh, members. And all of that stuff has to happen before we can offer a, a barrel. And we're making all of those decisions before we know how bad you guys want it and whether or not we're going to be able to sell the whole thing out before we got a tater sticker idea before we've even paid to design the stator, stator sticker and had the stickers made and all that stuff comes out of our pockets and we don't get reimbursed for it and blah, 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 blah. The list goes on and on. We're doing the best we can. And a great fine, job at that. <laughs> all right. So uh, I don't see any more questions here. Um, yeah, no, we're we're out of out of Q and A unless somebody wants to to throw anything at us live. 